Welcome to the Unreal Podcast with your host, Darren Lindley. In the Unreal Podcast, we tell true and amazing stories that will change your life. Over the last 15 years, we've surveyed more than 100,000 people and written more than 240 books filled with remarkable, hope-inspiring stories. Listen each week as we bring you another incredible story. The Unreal Podcast is brought to you by BooksBehindBars.net, a ministry dedicated to bringing the gospel to prisoners across America. What do you do when you're faced with the threat of your family being murdered? Javis Odom looked this one in the face. Learn what happened and the incredible impact this moment had on his life. I must warn you, there is an extremely violent moment about two-thirds the way through this episode. If this were to cause you emotional harm, we encourage you to stop listening and move on to the next episode, which may be more suitable for you. Now, Let's get into episode 12, On the Run, the story of Javis Odom, written by Karen Cuxwara. Hey man, put the gun away! I jumped back as he waved the pistol inches from my face. Put it down, man! You don't need to do this! Shut up! He lunged for his girlfriend with fire in his eyes. Y'all just shut up! He yelled. My mind raced. I had to act fast. One second I'd been offering him a cup of coffee. The next he was threatening his girlfriend's life and mine. I glanced around the room for something I could grab. A knife, perhaps. If I could get to him in time. Keep calm. Keep calm. I told myself despite my thumping heart. Stop it! His girlfriend screamed, her eyes full of terror. What are you doing? He lunged for his girlfriend again, dangling the gun before her with a sneer. What you say, B? He screamed. All right, just drop the gun, I said in the calmest voice I could muster. We don't need this nonsense, man. My mind was still racing, replaying the last few hours and fast forward. There were the drinks, a few too many, I suppose. We were all having a good time, though, or so I thought. Harmless fun, jokes between new friends. I had no reason not to trust the guy until I saw the gun. He jumped up onto a chair, still waving the gun in the air like a madman. You don't move, either of you, or I'll kill you both, and Dolores and Natasha. My blood went cold. It was one thing to threaten my life, but my wife and daughter? A new mixture of fury and fear swept through my bones as I stood frozen to the ground. Life and death hung in the balance, separated by one pull of the trigger. I had to stop this crazy man, now! And then suddenly, in a too-good-to-be-true move, the gun slipped from his hands as he lost his balance on the chair. It landed with a thud on the ground, inches from my feet. With Dolores' face in the forefront of my mind, I lunged for it and prayed. Most little boys have their future all mapped out from the time they're five years old. Garbage man, firefighter, race car driver, or whatever dad does. These are just a few of the predictable jobs on the list. As for me, I knew only one thing. I was going to be rich. But as it turns out, God had other plans. I was born on June 8, 1950 in Columbia, Mississippi, the fourth of six children to Robert and Brunetta Odom. We lived on our rural farm, barely outside town. My siblings and I took the bus into town for school each day. Our work began the moment the sun came up and ended when it went down. Between feeding the animals and tending the crops, there was never an idle moment around our place. From as early on as I can remember, my parents took us to church each Sunday. We attended a Southern Baptist church where my father served as a deacon and my mother presided as a missionary preacher. I never dared argue about going to Sunday services, for I knew the answer would always be the same. Going to church was a must. At six years old, I got saved. In my simple childlike mind, I understood it like this. If I confessed the bad things I did and asked Jesus to come into my life, 
He would be my Savior forever, and I could live with Him in heaven. It sounded like a pretty good deal to me. I liked the Bible stories okay, and the songs we sang weren't too bad either. I would try my best to be a good kid and obey my parents and God too. Getting saved wasn't the only eventful thing that happened to me at age six. I came down with a severe case of chicken pox, and doctors feared for my life. Not long after this, while riding in the back of my uncle's car, I slipped and fell off. The result was a hole in my head and a whole lot of blood. You could have been killed, son, the doctor said gravely as he stitched me up. Someone must be watching over you. I had a hunch who that someone was. Dad sometimes talked about God's call on your life. He said you would know when God called you to do something with your future. I wonder when my call would come. And then one day it did. When I was nine years old, I felt God say to me, Javis, you will go into the ministry. Whoa, I wasn't so sure I liked that. Being a preacher didn't seem very appealing. Most ministers I knew were poor, living in huts under destitute conditions around the world. I didn't want to be poor. God was supposed to make me rich. Perhaps there had been some mistake. Hey, fatty, a kid hollered as I stepped onto the school bus one day. Careful, or you'll tip the bus over. My cheeks burned. I had struggled with my weight since I was little, and it hadn't gotten any better as I grew older. I slid into an empty seat and put my head down. I didn't want to spend the rest of my life known as the chubby kid. I had to find a way to become a somebody, or I'd be a nobody forever. I tried out for the football team and was happy to make varsity. At 250 pounds, I could use my weight to my advantage on the field. At last, a place I belonged. Rooter, Rooter, my team chanted one day as we pumped ourselves up for the big game. I chuckled at my nickname. It felt good to be wanted and needed. Since I'd begun playing, my self-esteem had finally begun to pick up. I was known for my aggressiveness on the field. My quick temper often got the best of me during a game. I had no problem charging my opponent and taking him down. With the crowd cheering in the background, my adrenaline soared. I was made for football. I enjoyed school for the most part. I worked mornings at a local grocery store, headed to school, then spent my afternoons at practice. There was still work to be done on the farm when I got home later in the day, and then, of course, Sunday morning church was a must. For the most part, life was good. And for a while, I put my call to ministry on the back burner and rather hoped it might disappear altogether. I graduated from high school in 1968 and started junior college in Mississippi, planning to play football for the team. I soon transferred to another junior college where I ran into a pretty girl on my very first day on campus. I worked up the guts to approach her. Hey girl, you're pretty. God said you're going to be my wife one day, you know that? I boldly told her. Get away from me, boy, she rolled her eyes as she turned on her heel. I was determined to get her attention, though. I ran into her in the school cafeteria the next day and approached her. Hey there, it's you again, I said casually, leaning in with a smile. She set down her fork, a teeny grin tugging at the ends of her mouth. Hello, she said quietly. If you must know, my name is Dolores. Javis, I said eagerly, mind if I sit down? I was just finishing up here, Dolores stammered, standing up quickly. Maybe another day. I couldn't wipe the smile off my face as she walked away. I was going to pursue that girl if it killed me. Dolores may not have known it yet, but I was convinced she would one day be my wife. Dolores became friends with a girl I knew from my hometown. They invited me to a movie one night, and I didn't have to hesitate before saying yes. From that moment on, Dolores and I were friends. She sang in the school choir with me, and not long after that, we joined a band together. I loved spending time with Dolores and soon realized I was falling in love. We dated for two years and discussed marriage and having a family. I knew Dolores was the one for me. I could hardly wait to make her my wife. I was nominated student body president and enjoyed my new role. One weekend, during a big student body event, I decided to pop the question. As the sea of faces looked up at me from the crowd, I cleared my throat into the microphone. Dolores, I have just one question for you. 
Will you marry me? I asked, a hint of nervousness sinking in as I smiled down at her. Dolores smiled back from below, her face flushing as she bobbed her head up and down. Yes, yes, I will, she returned. The crowd cheered, and I beamed. Dolores and I were going to get married. We were married on June 6, 1970, in Dolores' mother's home. It was an intimate, beautiful ceremony. Two days later, we left for Los Angeles Baptist College in Newhall, California. I had accepted a scholarship there. We settled into our lives as newlyweds in the big city. For a while, all seemed good, and then my bullheaded ways got the best of me. I began challenging my professors, firing back questions after their talks, and stirring things up in my classes. I don't know if this is the place for me, I confessed to Dolores one day. These guys just don't think like me. I gotta get away from this place. Where are we gonna go then, Dolores asked with concern. I'll figure out something, I assured her. My oldest brother called one day. He had joined the Air Force and was stationed in Anchorage, Alaska. You should get up here, man, he encouraged me. This place is beautiful. You'll love it. I discussed the idea with Dolores. What do you think? We don't have much to lose at this point. It'll be an adventure. Dolores was a good sport and agreed to go. We packed up our little apartment and headed to Anchorage, where I discovered my brother was indeed right. I'd never seen such beautiful country in all my life. Endless, rugged mountains peaked into the clear blue sky. The vast waters outlined the sprawling city. I decided we could definitely settle down here. Dolores and I found a Baptist church to attend, but I became disgruntled with the pastor and left. From then on, I decided to stop going to church. I didn't agree with a lot of the stuff these guys had to say, and I was tired of wasting my time. And so, once again, I put God on the back burner. I started school at Anchorage Community College and found work as a gas fitter at a local gas company. That wasn't all I found, however. A new world opened up to me upon our arrival, the party world. A few guys at work suggested we go out to a club one night, and I didn't object. I'd grown up a pretty straight-laced kid, getting decent grades, playing sports, going to church every Sunday. Maybe it was time to break away and have a little fun. Before long, I was partying hard. I lived for the weekend when I could escape to the clubs, pound a few drinks, and have a good time. God blessed Dolores and me with a beautiful daughter we named Natasha in 1979. While I loved being a father, I loved partying just as much. I met a few guys on the street who knew how to show me a good time. What was the harm in having fun? I still managed to hold down my job, even picking up extra work at various places, like the post office, a youth center, and the parks and recreation department. It seemed for a while that all was just fine. One night as I lay in bed after downing a few too many drinks, I felt the Lord tug at my heart. Javis, remember me? I'm still here, waiting for you. I've called you. I tried to ignore the small voice, but it incessantly whispered to me. I thought back to the days of my youth, the many Bible stories I'd heard sitting in those pews at church on Sunday. I remembered the call on my life at nine years old, the call I so adamantly tried to ignore. As I looked at the empty beer can next to my bed, I found it hard to believe that God could really be calling a guy like me into the ministry. A few years passed and I continued to dabble with partying. I prayed from time to time, but Dolores and I had stopped going to church, and in a way, it felt good to answer to nobody. I held down various jobs, but I wanted adventure. I began thinking about buying a boat. We lived on the water in beautiful Anchorage. Tourists flitted through the city all summer long. Perhaps if I bought a fishing boat, I could make a living conducting tours. In 1984, I purchased a 28-foot-long aluminum jet boat. It fit six easily and had deep sides so that five-year-old Natasha could ride along with me without falling out. I advertised and within no time I had a good customer base for my fishing trip tours. Every weekend, I took the boat out on the water, venturing up to Seward, down the deep creek part of the ocean. 
I love showing people a good time, instructing them how to fish and watching their pleased faces as we jetted all over the water. Two years into the business, I had things running smoothly. I navigated the ocean with confidence and knew when to turn around quickly and get back to shore if a storm arose. But when water filled up that aluminum boat out of nowhere one sunny afternoon, I was taken by surprise. Go! Check it out! I called to one of the guys at the front of the boat. See where the leak's at! If we can stop it! A few seconds later, he called back to me. Bad news, man! Engine's completely submerged in water. Doesn't look good. I can't quite tell where the leak's coming from, though. I pushed to the front of the boat to inspect it myself. Indeed, the engine was completely submerged. The boat would not start. I bent down and lifted up the floorboard. I was shocked to see a huge zigzag crack in the bottom of the boat. I'd never seen anything like it. I have no idea how this happened, I murmured, shaking my head. This is really strange. We gotta act fast, though. Get this water out of here before the boat becomes submerged. A preacher happened to be on the boat at the time. He began praying as we scrambled to scoop all the water out of the boat. I mumbled a prayer along with him, hoping God would hear at least one of us and get us back on dry land. At last, the engine rumbled back to life. Paul cheered with relief. I've never seen an engine start on the water like that, the preacher said in disbelief. What's going on with you, man? Something you're not telling us? His comment startled me. I shook my head. Don't want to talk about it, I said quietly. Deep down, I wondered if God might be trying to get my attention, telling me to quit fishing and start preaching. But I wasn't ready to give up my own agenda just yet. Back home safely that night, I told Dolores about the incident. It was the strangest thing I've ever seen, I said. I have no idea how the boat got that crack. Well, the important thing is you're all right, she assured me. The incident didn't deter me from taking the boat out again. I embarked on another fishing trip the following weekend, taking my passengers up the sea toward Seward. It was another beautiful day. The sun was shining and there wasn't a cloud in the sky. I couldn't imagine what could possibly go wrong, but something did. Water's in the boat, a passenger suddenly called out as we got out to sea. What? I looked back and sure enough, water was rapidly filling the bottom of the boat. Not again! I cried. Passengers scrambled and grabbed for their belongings as the entire bottom of the boat became submerged. I had to act quickly. Within minutes, I discovered something baffling. There was a zigzag crack identical to the other one, this one on the opposite side of the boat. Some might call it a coincidence, but in my heart I knew better. Someone was trying to get my attention. This guy's having trouble breathing, a passenger cried, pointing to a man next to him. We gotta get to shore fast. The man who had seated near the nearly submerged engine was suffering from exhaust inhalation. I glanced around frantically as the scene suddenly became very real. People's lives were at stake. I had to fix this boat and get us to dry land without wasting a moment. Hold on, I called. I have an idea. I managed to veer the boat to a nearby bank where I stepped out and raced for the nearest tree. With the help of a friend, I cut down a small tree and trimmed on a piece of wood, which I drove into the hole to temporarily stop the leak. We swiftly scooped as much water as we could out of the boat and I climbed back in. I'm gonna get us back to port, I assured everyone as calmly as I could. Just hang in there. The engine still had a bit of life left in it, but it struggled to cooperate. We chugged along at just a few miles an hour. The seconds crawled by, and the port seemed an eternity away. Inside, I was a mess. I knew in my heart God was asking me to quit the fishing business, and this incident had confirmed it once and for all. I could only hope and pray we made it back to the port safely so he could give me a second chance. It took us three hours to make the 30-mile trek back to port. The passengers climbed out weak, but all in one piece. I apologized for the traumatic journey. Fluke thing, I guess. Looks like stress fracture, one of my guys said, inspecting the zigzag crack more closely. Strange that it happened on both sides of the boat. Strange, but not that strange, I told myself with a wry smile. You win, God, I whispered. 
I knew what I had to do, and I didn't want to waste one more minute not doing it. I returned to the church I had left several years before and asked to speak to the pastor. I know I didn't leave on the best terms, I told him remorsefully. I'm really sorry. God has done a work in my life, and I'm tired of running from him. I forgive you, he said warmly, and I want to apologize too. The important thing is that you obey God's calling on your life going forward. He smiled. I guess I don't have to remind you the story of Jonah and the whale. Jonah thought he could run away from God and avoid preaching to those crazy people of Nineveh. But we all know what happened to him. I guess you can be thankful it was only a leak and you didn't get swallowed by a whale. I laughed. Yeah, you could say that. We all realized you had the call of God on your life when you were here, the pastor went on. Now's the time. You bet, I said eagerly. I don't want to run from God anymore. I want to run for him. Come to Bible study tonight and preach for us. Tonight? I swallowed hard. No time like the present. Right, I grinned. I was tired of playing games. The pastor was right. Now was my time. I may have wasted many years of my life running, but God had given me a second chance. I could now choose to obey him and fulfill the calling he had on my life. A couple of days later, my wife told me we'd be having visitors. My girlfriend came into town with her boyfriend, she said. They plan to move here and want to check out one of our apartments. Right now, they're staying in a local hotel. Dolores and I owned an apartment building and rented the apartments out to generate income. We currently had one vacancy left, and I hoped we could fill it with new tenants. Great, I replied. Let's get them set up. We showed Dolores' friend and her boyfriend the place, and they agreed to rent it. Why don't you come back to our place tonight, and we can get you all sorted out in the morning, I suggested. We set our guests up in our place, and I pulled a few beers out of the fridge. Drink anyone, I called out, tossing one to the boyfriend. We stayed up late that night, talking and getting to know one another over drinks. At last, Dolores and I turned in to bed. When we awoke in the morning, I heard fighting in the other room. I casually sauntered into the kitchen and started a pot of coffee. Can I get you a cup of coffee? I called out to our new friends, hoping my friendly interruption would stop the screaming. As I turned around, I was horrified to see the boyfriend standing there with a gun. Whoa, whoa, put the gun down, I cried. What are you doing, man? I'm going to kill you. And I'm going to kill Dolores and Natasha too, the guy screamed. Stop it! Put the gun down, his girlfriend cried. But he only lunged at her in anger. Come on, man. Let's just be cool. Put it down, I urged, my heart racing fast. How could this be happening? Last night, we'd all been getting along famously. And now the guy was turning crazy. He hopped up onto a chair and the pistol slipped from his hands and fell to the ground. Without thinking twice, I dove for it and grabbed it with both hands. Don't make me shoot you, I hollered. I tried to keep my hands steady and my face stoic as I trained the gun on him. What happened next felt like the slow motion part of a horror movie. The crazy guy spun around and appeared to reach for something in his back pocket. In one swift motion, I pulled the trigger on the pistol and he fell to the ground a small pool of blood trickling from his bullet wound. Horrified, I dropped the pistol and raced to his side. He appeared unconscious, but was it possible that I had killed him? My entire body shook as I stumbled backward, replaying the last few blurry seconds in my mind. I was so sure he was going to shoot me. I was only trying to defend myself and protect my family. I hadn't meant to kill him. Already, I was rehearsing my defending statement. This couldn't be happening. The next few hours were a blur of commotion. The paramedics took the man to the hospital where he was pronounced dead. I was arrested and charged with second-degree murder. A trial would take place in the near future. Just like that, my life had changed forever. It felt both strange and devastating to have the word murderer attached to my name. I knew people were talking, whispering behind my back, wondering how I could have done such a thing. I defended myself repeatedly with the simple explanation. I was trying to protect my family. 
I prayed fervently, asking God how this could have happened and what I was to do now. I am the one who protected your family, and I am the one who will continue to protect your family. I shared with Dolores what God had told me. I'm going to have to do time, I said somberly. You've lost your mind, Javis, Dolores deplored. You haven't even had your trial yet. Why don't you wait and see what happens? But I knew in my heart, I'd heard God clearly, I would serve my sentence with dignity. The trial finally arrived, and I sat tall in the defendant's seat, listening as the conviction was read. Second-degree murder. The word sounded harsh as it echoed throughout the room. I tried to remain strong. God was my defender, the only one I had to answer to. As the judge whacked his gavel down on the table and pronounced my sentence, I spoke up. With all due respect, sir, I'm not going to serve time. The judge raised his brow, surprised by my outburst. The time is going to serve me, I finished. The judge was a bit baffled. He had a difficult time sentencing me, as he had never seen anyone accept a sentence with such grace. I don't want to do this, but I'm giving you 15 years in prison, he said. I left the courtroom with my head held high, ready to accept my fate. God I surrender this situation to you, I prayed. I do not want to do this, but you are in control. I trust you will take care of me and my family while we are apart. I hugged Dolores and Natasha fiercely and told them I love them. It's not forever, I assured them. We will be together again. I began my prison time in Wildwood Correctional Facility in Kenai, Alaska. Upon entering my cell, I prayed and asked God what he wanted me to do with this time. He answered me very clearly, trust me and be a spokesperson for me. I will give you the words and your job is to give them out. Your assignment is to get people ready for me. I had spent my whole life running from God despite the calling on my life for ministry and at an early age. God had spared my life time after time, even in the midst of bad choices. But now it was time to step up to the plate. I never dreamed that my ministry might start behind bars. But here I was in a cold, bare jail cell, ready to obey his command. I began holding Bible studies in the prison and was amazed at the large turnout of men. They were hungry for the word of God and eager to learn how they could transform their lives and start fresh. I shared my story with them and assured them that it was never too late to make things right with God. All they needed to do was simply put their trust in Him as the Savior of their life. At 2.45 every afternoon, I called a prayer time. Again, many men came forward. I returned to my bed each night humbled by what God was doing. He was using an ordinary man like me to reach those who needed Him most, but my work was just beginning. From there, I was moved to another minimum security prison. There I met the chaplain and became his assistant. We brainstormed about various religious activities the prison system could offer the inmates. God showed me the broken hearts of men who desperately needed him in their life, hearts I would not have been able to touch had I not been sentenced for my crime. Just as Romans 8.28 says, God was working all things together for good. Dolores and Natasha visited me every other weekend. It's so hard being apart, Dolores confessed, her face weary and sad. I can't wait for us to be together again. Me too, I sighed. I miss you both so much. God is working here, though, and time is passing quickly. I have to remain faithful to what he wants me to do. I saw more than 500 men give their lives to God during my time in prison. After eight years, I was sent to a halfway house and put on parole, grateful to be released and excited about what God was going to do through the prison system. I began taking Bible classes and continued preaching in the prisons. Volunteers picked me up every week. I even had the chance to preach in a women's prison and minister to the hurting ladies there. God was truly changing my heart, filling me with compassion, and preparing me for full-time ministry. The chaplain and I remained good friends. He was a constant mentor, friend, and encourager. God is using you, Javis, he said. He's really doing something big around here. 
God provided for Dolores and Natasha during my time away, protecting them as he had promised me he would. When I got out of prison, Dolores announced that the money we had saved had sustained her literally until my last day. We praised God for his provision all the way down to the last dime. My Bible classes excited me so much that I decided to go back to school. I obtained two bachelor's degrees from Friends International Christian University in Anchorage. From there, I pursued my master's in Christian counseling and my doctorate degree in religious studies. During my studies, God made the next step very clear. Start a church. Dolores and I started a church in our home. It soon grew to a hundred people on Sunday mornings. People packed into our small living room every week, wedging themselves between sofa cushions and spreading out on the floor. We knew we needed a building if we were to keep growing, so we began asking different churches around town for help. One day, as I drove through the city, I heard God tell me to drive to a specific Lutheran church. I had gotten used to not questioning God's ways, so I listened to Him and turned my car around. After I parked at the Lutheran church, I was surprised to see a man standing on the steps of the building. I climbed out of my car and strode toward him. Are you the pastor, I asked, squinting in the bright sunlight. The man looked a bit taken back. Then he said, yes, I'm Pastor Dan. A little while ago, the Lord told me to stand here, that a man was coming to speak with me. You must be him. Now it was my turn to smile. Wow, well, we're on the same page, because he told me to come find you. I explained that I'd started a church in my home and needed a larger space to meet. After talking back and forth, Pastor Dan agreed to rent the building to us. I was floored by God's gracious provision and perfect timing. We now had a real church building. We named our church Turning Point Christian Church, and we have been serving the community of Anchorage since January of 1996. The goal of my preaching is to build up people with purpose and raise and equip them for making an impact on the world. I encourage them with the words that God has often encouraged me with. I will reward you with your righteous commitment. Keep your eyes on me. The prisons remain a key part of our ministry. Since I served my own time after leaving prison, I began to think long and hard about the system. So many inmates leave the prison system without any support and return to their old ways. I want to reach out to them and let them know there is hope that with God's help, They don't need to look back and return to the past. Jesus said in Matthew 11, 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I share with the prisoners. You may carry heavy burdens, but Jesus wants to free you from them. We've also begun working with the youth, mentoring them to become men and women of God. If the youth can be reached at a young age, they can be spared painful years ahead making wrong decisions that might lead them down the path I once walked. Having a purpose in Christ gives them hope for tomorrow, and hope is what we all need. Happy anniversary, Dolores said one recent morning, planting a kiss on my cheek. How many years is this, I asked. Forty-one to be exact. I've been putting up with you forty-one years, Dolores teased. I kissed my wife and thanked God for the years he'd given us together. We had been through many hard times, but God had been so faithful, providing for all of our needs and giving us the strength to go on when things looked bleak. I knew things hadn't always been easy for Dolores, but she had remained by my side, a loving and dedicated wife, one I vowed never to take for granted. As I headed to church that morning, I glanced out at the familiar Alaska mountains and took a moment to recount my journey. When I was a young boy, Satan had tried hard to snuff out my life and discourage me. But God had kept his hand on me over the years, from the perilous waters of the ocean to my dark prison cell. Like Jonah in the Bible, I had tried to play things my own way, running from God in search of what I believed to be a better life. But he didn't give up on pursuing me, and because of his steadfastness, I now reach others through my ministry. I may not be rich like I thought I deserved to be as a boy, but I am wealthier in more ways than I can count. 
And just like I promised that preacher years ago, I no longer ran from God, but for Him. Today's story brings one of the central reasons for Books Behind Bars and the Unreal podcast into focus. Javis was incarcerated while in prison. God used him to minister to lots of men. More than 500 came to Jesus while he was incarcerated. That's truly amazing. We want to reach out to America's prisoners. As we send books into prison, these inmates get a chance to hear stories that deeply impact them. These stories bring hope and show that there is a future available that they may have never imagined possible. Help us bring hope to these inmates. Would you please go to booksbehindbars.net today and join with us in reaching out to these incarcerated people? For the last two weeks of the year, we have a sponsor who is committed to doubling the donation of every single sponsorship that comes into Books Behind Bars. Whether you sponsor one book a month or 25 books a month, our donor has committed to doubling your sponsorship for the life of your gift. So if you sponsor two books a month for five years, he's committed to doubling that for five years. Please help us reach inmates. This matching gift ends December 31st, 2019. Don't forget to share the links to the Unreal Podcast and Facebook. You're helping to expose so many more people to the gospel every time you share one of these podcasts. 